Local programming on KRWG made possible in part by viewers like you. Thank you. This is KRWG TV, radio, online, news that matters. Now, across the Mosia Valley and the borderland, the stories that shape our community. From the KRWG Broadcast Center at New Mexico State University, this is Newsmakers. Up front this week, the New Mexico Farm and Ranch Heritage Museum. The museum describes itself as 47 acres packed with real stories about real people. The interactive museum has welcomed visitors from all over the world. And as Living Here's Ralph Escandon shows us, it brings to life the 4,000 year history of farming and ranching in New Mexico. Thank you. 
insert it in the head center, it breaks fast for me. One, two, three sides for the crown. Okay, what we're gonna do is make some wafer cookies. And we're gonna, we've got some cookie dough that we made up. We roll it into little balls. And each one of these balls will be a cookie. We'll put one on this side and one on this side. And then we'll squish her down. Count to 10, 1,001, 1,002. Okay, now let's do it one more time. 1,001. 1,002, 1,003, 1,003. Yeah, they're done. All right, we got cookies. We got wafer cookies. We got cookies. Better and better. I know. <laughs> Whoa! Now it's time to break your legs with the rest of the day. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody get one? So you see big veins like this, normally it's a big, deep well. My name is Cassie McClure. I'm president of Las Cruces Press Women. We are an organization of members of the press, but also writers and photographers, uh, communications people just in general. We also have graphic designers. We have a lot of different aspects of communication that we represent. We're accepting of men and women, and the turnoff is a little bit that it's Las Cruces Press Women, but We've stumbled upon some really great people who have decided to also throw their hats in the ring for joining us because you know we, we offer some sort of networking and some sort of events and something to get behind that they really enjoy. We have a scholarship specifically through NMSU and it is the Ruth Sneed um, Scholarship. If anybody wants to apply, it's through the Scholar Dollars Program. The focus is on ag communications because we're an ag school and so we're going to actually be awarding in September two scholarships of about $350 to two students that we know, I can't spoil it, I don't know what their names are yet. I found our events to be very helpful in being able to hone skills to make me a better journalist but also a better writer and just to meet people. And all of our events are open to the public because we, we want people to get an idea of what the media does and what we do and how we do it. Our upcoming event is going to be Art of the Interview Panel. So it's panel slash workshop. I just had a love for writing as a child growing up in college and um, I wasn't really sure what I wanted to do with it and somebody scooped me up and said, hey, you like to write, come work at the college newspaper. And that was my first experience with journalism and I just fell in love with it and went from there. I think communication is important for everybody, not just people who do it for a living. I think it's a really valuable skill set to develop, um, whether it's talking on camera or writing on paper or any kind of, of communication. Being clear and concise is, is key. We have member-only events, which is the benefit of being a member of Las Cruces Press Women. We have uh, members-only meetings and uh, a, an event called Writer's Block that helps uh, develop writing, writers. Um, that's a, usually a monthly event. It felt like I've improved my skills in areas that I wouldn't necessarily have worked on if I hadn't met other people in the group. You can go online to our website, uh, lascrucespresswomen.org. We post regularly on there upcoming events, things that are going on. We are really active on our social media, Facebook and Twitter. Find us on those to learn uh, what we have coming up and, and how to get involved.
advice to, to aspiring communicators, whether that's journalism, fiction, any of that, is just you really have to have the passion for it. You really do. Because the reward of being so passionate about something and seeing your work come to life, that's really what it's all about. They're one of America's favorite sweet treats, yet not too many people realize the work it takes to make a good batch of chocolate. Growing Discoveries takes a closer look at some very tasty research. Danielle Peltier is an NMSU undergraduate student and track athlete who is conducting research on how to make delicious chocolate using milks other than dairy milk. The idea for her research came from an honors chocolate class she took her freshman year. We're sitting in class and we're talking how it was made and I was like, why can't it be made with other things? And then I've always been a person who likes to find questions to things that people haven't found out yet. So I thought it was the perfect opportunity for me to find something new. Danielle has been experimenting with powdered soy, goat and coconut milk, as well as powdered peanut butter to create chocolates that vegans and those with food allergies and dietary restrictions can enjoy. I know people have tried my chocolate and were shocked that it was made with other things. So even if someone's idea for chocolate isn't I need something that's lactose free for my allergies or sugar free for my diabetes or anything, they can still enjoy the chocolate and say, wow, this is a good chocolate no matter what's in it. Although Danielle began her research on her own, she's had the help of NMSU food science professor and chocolate expert Stuart Munson McGee, who met Danielle while teaching the chocolate course that inspired her research. She's also kind of serving as a model that um, we're working on to get more students involved, especially in food research at the undergraduate level. I think it does a really good job of trying to connect their classroom learning with real practical learning, but it also asks them to stretch their mind and their imagination in ways that a classroom just doesn't do. Danielle hopes that her research will one day help her deliver her chocolate products to you the consumer. Her research on chocolate is just one example of some of the tasty research going on at NMSU, proving that learning can be something worth sinking your teeth into. Welcome to In Focus, I'm Anthony Moreno. Today we hear how the possible repeal and replacement of the Affordable Care Act may impact New Mexico. Joining us in studio is Renee Dupre, Research Fellow with the Burrell College of Osteopathic Medicine. Renee, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. Now I'd like to start off in talking about uh, how through your research have you discovered how New Mexicans may be impacted by the re possible repeal of the Affordable Care Act? Well, in one word, the impact will be devastating on New Mexico and New Mexicans. We have one of the largest populations of Medicaid in the entire United States. Literally half of our population is on Medicaid. We have 270,000 New Mexicans who have been helped by the Medicaid expansion under the Act. Those people stand to lose coverage immediately. Um, that's just for a start. We're also looking, and I want to emphasize that the impact of this is going to go across um, income brackets, that people with employer-sponsored coverage, with people with private insurance, are also going to be losing coverage and receiving less coverage for more money. Now, it's, Medicaid is such an important um, thing here in New, for many New Mexicans. You mentioned half of the people in the state um, um, may be on Medicaid right now. Mm -hmm. And also, speaking of the state, I mean, what is the state doing in regards to Medicaid right now that you know of? Well, the state right now is trying to figure out how they can continue to afford to pay for Medicaid. And one of the things that they have done is they have put together a proposal to the federal Department of Health and Human Services about how they're going to move forward. And within that proposal, they're suggesting that people will start having to co put in a copay, um, even for very, very low income people. They're looking at making people recertify far more frequently, either every quarter or every six months. Um, they're eliminating a program that's designed for single parents who might, that gives them like four months of grace if they start receiving some child custody payments. So though there are four or five big things that are gonna have a big impact and mostly 
the net impact is going to be that people who are eligible for the program are no longer going to be receiving those cares because they're just going to drop off the rolls. They're going to make it so hard to be on Medicaid. And the benefits, um, it, the other proposal that's out there right now um, is that the, our secretary would have a lot of leeway in terms of just determining what benefits are there and what benefits aren't with Medicaid. And so we'd be losing a, lo looking at losing a lot of benefits. Wow. Um, the health care debate it has went from the House to now the Senate. Um, as far as things are going right now with that, what are some changes that you think may happen with the proposed health care bill in the Senate that uh, came out of the House? I mean, how, how is it possibly looking to change? What are some things that you're reading from it, from the research that you've been doing and you know, keeping up with it? That's a hard question to answer because most of this has been done behind closed doors. Um, what we know has come out mostly by leaks. Just we've got a few things that we do know um, that they are putting what I could call window dressing on some of the more onerous um, aspects of the House bill. Like in, what? What? When, what are, give me an example of window dressing. Uh, of these aspects right. that you're talking about. For instance, they are now saying that, well, maybe they're going to stretch out the period under which the Medicaid changes are going to happen. The big change, that and this is an important change in Medicaid that they're proposing, they're proposing that we move from our current really flexible, um, responsive system in which the federal government kind of steps in to help states when the economy is not doing so well. And so there's no cap on how much the federal government can pay. Remember, Medicaid is a, a federal state partnership program. And so right now we've had this real kind of dynamic teeter-totter sort of relationship. What they want to move to is a capped system in which each state, based on how many people were on Medicaid the year before, would get a certain amount of money for the following year. And that money is looking at substantially less. We're looking at an $834 billion decrease in the national Medicaid budget. Now, how can that impact a state like New Mexico that's already struggling right now with a budget crisis? It'll be devastating. Um, we're looking at $467 million a year that New Mexico is going to have to come up with out of the, its own coffers. Um, we're not going to be getting the federal funding over between now and two, 2026. We're looking at $11.8 billion that won't be coming into New Mexico. And we've got to figure out how we're going to do it. You know, there's just no way. <laughs> we're already struggling with like a hundred million dollar deficit. One of the popular uh, parts of the Affordable Care Act was the protection of pre-existing conditions. Uh, do, are there any signs that that protection may be um, loosened some or perhaps taken out uh, with the proposed uh, bill by the um, uh, Republicans in Congress right now? And that bill is the American Health Care Act. Mm -hmm. um, and so under the American Health Care Act, states would have the leeway to sign up for a waiver. Not only of the leeway, but they also get a little bit of a push because they get more money if they sign up for a waiver. Under that waiver, all of the protections of the ACA would basically be repealed. So states would have complete latitude in, what, in terms of what they chose to do. And most states, because of the financial pressure, would end up having to put all that money into high-risk pools. And with that, they're going to be really eliminating those protections for the, um, for the pre-existing conditions. Now, one of the proposals that I just heard kind of leaked out right now from the Senate version is that if you had a pre-existing condition, you might have to pay more. You could still purchase insurance, but you would not be able to be covered for that particular ailment. So say you had cancer 10 years ago and you were doing fine and you went and you bought coverage. If that cancer came back, you'd be covered for your primary care and your other visits. We wouldn't broke your arm, but you wouldn't be covered for the cancer treatment. Now that's one of the proposals that I've heard has, um, has come out in the, in the Senate version. One of the other things that I was a little curious about was how may um, people dealing with mental health or perhaps substance abuse be impacted if the um, ACA is repealed and replaced? That's a really good question. Um, 
New Mexico has a big problem with substance abuse. We know that under the ACA, at least 403,000 New Mexicans were able to receive additional mental health and substance abuse benefits. They got more care for those problems through the ACA. All of that would be repealed. That would go away. Um, and you know, we're in the middle of an opioid overdose crisis in our nation, and New Mexico ranks seventh in the nation in opioid deaths. It could be really, really bad for us. Are there any other possible programs that were expanded um, under the American, um, uh, under the ACA that was, uh, you know, seemed to have great success that may be in jeopardy now if uh, the Affordable Care Act should be repealed? Well, the first one that comes to mind, and this is you know, Section 101 of the ACA, the Prevention and Public Health Act. That pays for our prevention funding, including half of our money for vaccines for children, including 100% of our money that we're using to do chronic disease management for things like diabetes and heart disease, to help people educate people and get people access to better foods. and. So all of that prevention money that we've been really investing in under the ACA would be going away. It also eliminates a program that we've had in our hospitals, which is a program focused on reducing hospital-acquired um, infections. And we know right now that we're having trouble using our antibiotics. We're getting more and more antibiotic resistance. That program was designed to stem that, and that program would also go away. That's also our emergency public health funding. So with public health, we're a big part of any sort of emergency response to a, a threat like the Ebola virus or Zika or even measles. Any disease that's spreading quickly, we wouldn't have the money for that anymore. We would not be able to respond to that from the public health perspective. Wow. Well, Renee, I want to thank you so much for being here and thank you for uh, sharing the information about the research that you've done on this and we'll we'll stay updated on this as as we watch out how things unfold and thank you so much for giving your time. Thanks so much for having me. We want to thank you for joining us for In Focus. I'm Anthony Morneau. We house the local history, we curate the local history, we take care of it, and we make it available for the community or for tourists who are coming looking for information on the area. It's been here quite a while. It's over 45 years old. It's a community museum and the things have been given by our community. We have one of the finest pottery collections in the area and that's probably our most valuable collections of what's prehistoric. Arrowheads also, they have been documented and researched by people from other museums. We are totally nonprofit. We're a 501c3. We are owned by the Sierra County Historical Society, so our means of, of keeping going is constant fundraising and constant volunteering. In the gift shop, we have a lot of consignees that are local, so we don't have to buy up front. We can, and we promote this way, we promote local artists. But the consignees are extremely important, and I think at last count there were over 60 consignees in the gift shop, and they all have a local connection. One of the main missions of the museum is is education, of course, and so we hope that a person comes here and we hope that they understand the history and how people lived previ in previous days. And also, 
by virtue of our displays, we hope that this encourages people to stay a few more days. Then our research department that we put together in the last few years is very good because genealogy is probably the first or second most popular hobby in the United States today. And so we get people who are looking for their roots, so to speak, and if they are not in a hurry, they are interested in staying here and finding out where great-grandfather's ranch was or where he was buried. Or, and so by our research department, by virtue of that, we can keep them in the area for for another several days or weeks and interest people perhaps in moving here. It's, it's all community oriented. It's all about community and volunteers and I think this is what makes it so special. And kids love museums. It, it, they don't think they're going to, but then they do when they find out that they're, what it's all about. Then the log cabin has really, really helped with that because everybody's excited to go in the log cabin. It's six dollars per person. If we have a family of six or something like that, we cap it at fifteen dollars. So if uh, and auntie and uncle and, and grandpa and grandma come to I, the, we cap it at $15 and that's mainly for families with children so that uh, the fee doesn't become something that's prohibitive. It's 211 Main. It's in the downtown part of Tier C. We're open seven days a week. Uh, on Sunday we don't open until noon. They can go to our website we also have Facebook. The best way is to come by. That's our time for now. Join us this week on KRWG Radio. Every weekday, it's Morning Edition 5 to 9, fresh air at 11, followed by Here and Now, noon to 2, and All Things Considered, 4 to 7. KRWG News is always online at krwg.org, and we'd love to hear from you. Email us with your story ideas and video submissions. The address is feedback at nmsu.edu. For all of us at KRWG News, I'm Fred Martino. Have a great week. We'll see you next time on Newsmakers.